The Apostle Paul prophesied that in the end times, during the season of the Lord's return, we would be confronted with perilous times when people would love themselves, love money, and love pleasure. He was echoing the words of Jesus who had proclaimed that society would be as immoral and violent when He returns as it was in the days of Noah. Have those perilous times arrived? Stay tuned for an interview with Eric Barger. Lamb and Lion Ministries presents Christ in Prophecy, a program that focuses on the fundamentals of Bible prophecy, showing how current events in the news relate to biblical predictions of end time events and the soon return of Jesus. Now, here's your host, Dr. David Reagan. Greetings in the name of Jesus, our blessed hope, and welcome to Christ in Prophecy. My colleague Nathan Jones and I have a very special guest in the studio today. He is Eric Barger, the founder of a ministry called Take a Stand. And that is exactly what Eric has done, folks. He speaks out boldly in defense of the fundamentals of the Christian faith, and he minces no words in doing so. No one will ever accuse him of tiptoeing <laughs> through the tulips. Welcome to Christ in Prophecy, brother. Thank you, David. I appreciate it. Good to see both of you. Oh, uh, so good to have you back on, Eric. Thank you, Nathan. Well, let's get back to how it, Dr. Reagan started the program with. He gave us a question. Are we living in perilous times? Yes or no? Absolutely. And incidentally, where does that term come from? Oh, it's in 2 Timothy chapter 3. Yeah, it says that in times will be perilous times. Right, perilous times. And in that time, people will be lovers of themselves more yeah. than lovers of God, monstrous, proud, arrogant, deceivers, yeah. God haters. There's a whole list there. And that really, when you, when you see what verse 4 says, that's aimed at the church, not the world. Mm -hmm. It describes what the church, church or what the world looks like today. But when you look at what is said in verse 4, they have a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. So, Paul is, is aiming this at people who are in a religious setting rather than... Well, I know every time I watch the evening news, I think of that passage. Exactly. Oh, we're here. Oh, yeah. we are. We are. We so see you're it saying in the world. we are in perilous times. Yeah. We see it in the world. We see it in the church. We are in perilous times. So, we are Second Timothy. Yeah, that's right. And I believe okay. we're going to deal with a world that looks darker and darker, and it's going to turn darker and more against and opposed to the things that we would stand for as Christians. Well, give so, us some examples then, because uh, as you said, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasures, lovers, lovers of God. God, having the form of godliness but denying its power. What are some examples today that show well, us that we're living in these perilous times? That's the extreme times? narcissism, really. Narciss that's what Paul is, is really describing okay. there. That's a word, of course, we use, but not one we, we see in the Bible. But I think maybe one of the things that disturbs me the most about that is the idea that our free speech and our, our um, uh, discussion of the gospel, our ability to disseminate the gospel, those things. I think are being put in in uh, in the crosshairs of those who want to want to stop. They don't want to hear the gospel. So they, kind of Christian persecution, free speech, and political correctness all all of that working together. Yep, and okay. it's happening here in our culture, let alone in a communist culture or another culture around the world that would never have been as free as ours is. But it's happening in our culture. Uh, we see a case, or a case up in Canada, a very famous case in 2013, where the Canadian Supreme Court called the Bible hate speech. Oh. Really? Where, uh, yeah, and and most of this is started at the at the level of the of the human rights groups and the human rights commissions. Whenever you see those kind of things, these are bureaucrats who are appointed mm -hmm. and who are making um, delineations about whether something is hate speech or something isn't. And of course, well, and, and a result of that is that in Canada right now, if you speak out against abortion or speak out against same-sex marriage or homosexuality on the air, I know you'll be fined fifty thousand dollars. And if you do it a second time, you're off the air. That's right. We I, had a conference recently where we mentioned those topics over and Canada YouTube cut us off so that they could not hear us talk about the sexual perversion movement and other topics yeah, I know, like that. Yeah, I know. I've been waiting for a witch to, to sue one of us, one, <laughs> one of our people to talk about this stuff because we made her feel bad or him feel oh, bad yeah, about their, you know, I've been waiting for that because you see the other things that have happened. You know, in Canada this summer, there's a, there's a summer jobs uh, movement, and it's been out there for quite a while, that the government will help fund summer jobs. Mm. But before a nonprofit can get a grant, they have to check a box that says they agree with abortion. Now that, that's Trudeau's wow. doing. That's where we're headed in this country. It is. It is. And we better wake up here because I think our free speech, I don't think, I know it's under attack here the same. The same ideas are being perpetrated on this side. Well, California, 
they want to put a clamp on, on conferences and on any books or DVDs that, um, that go against the LGBT community and that kind of thing. So that's happening. They've got a law that they're trying to run through their... You can't their, even share the gospel with someone who is a transvestite, for instance, and say, hey, Christ can rescue from that because that's hate speech against transvestites. That, that's right. They want to make that illegal, that we can't, uh, wow. we can't minister to people in that Eric, way. Eric, you've put out a, a wonderful video called something, I think it's called Perilous Times. It is. Give us some points from it. Well, preparing for perilous times, I go down kind of the list. I talk about that case in Canada and, and several others here in the U.S. Uh, one in Ireland where uh, a pastor in Ireland uh, was put on trial because in a 45-minute message for 30 seconds he spoke about Islam in a negative way. So we see all these kind of things going on. Now he, by the way, was let off. Yeah, he, he was exonerated. But um, we see these things and then by going through that list and just trying to say to the church, don't be asleep at the switch here. The church is sleeping as you know. We all know that we see this happening around us where people don't want to hear about this stuff. It's construed as negative and uh, it's too upsetting so we don't want to deal with it. But when it comes to roost at our front door and we're not able to, to share the gospel, what are we doing with, the, with what Christ gave us to do? We were left here to share a message. If we don't go out and do that, we're in trouble. We are in spiritual trouble and we need to share that message boldly and hey, around us right now we're going to have to make some decisions about whether we're just going to let this happen unabated or whether we're going to stand up against this movement to try to stop us from sharing the gospel openly here in our country. Well, what are some specific things that you're concerned about that make this perilous times? There are three, I think, three uh, elements that we're going to fight between now and the time the Lord comes. Number one would be the LGBT community and that whole, the whole idea of whether you can speak openly about this from the scriptures. You know the letters of that get longer and longer. They sure so do. I just, I so I just call it now, I just call it the sexual perversion <laughs> That's movement. right. <laughs> I stop. I can't keep I, up with the letters. I stop short of all the rest of the letters in, in the order that the alphabet doesn't go. That's one. Uh, second is speaking out about other religions, Islam in particular. Mm -hmm. um, a bill was passed back in uh, 2011 to, uh, to allow uh, uh, countries of the world, this was in the UN Security Council, to allow countries in the world to stop anyone from speaking ill of anybody else's faith. Well, goodbye to apologetics at that yeah. point. Good, goodbye to polemics, totally. So you're not going to be able to do that. That was resolution, let's see, Resolution 1615, I believe it was. I'll, it's in the DVD, but you know, there's a resolution at the UN right now. Now, we didn't, uh, that didn't pass here in the U.S. because it takes our Senate to do that yeah. in our country. So it's not law here. But uh, during the last administration, they tried to get that through. It reminds me of a, a sign I saw recently of a person on a college campus holding up a sign that said, No free speech that hurts feelings. Yeah. Well, wow. somebody's going to get hurt on one side I mean, or the other. Yeah, on. I know. Yeah. Well, everybody's concerned about everybody's feelings except Christians. That's right. That's right. <laughs> well, we're, we're an easy target, they think. We but are the target. We are the target for sure. Um, you know, our First Amendment is the single thing that's held this back in our country. We still have free speech, even though, of course, today it's the loudest one that can shout somebody else down wins. Yes. Yeah. It, it, there's no... Um, Breakdown there, of discourse. Exactly. Discourse. Uh, there isn't any discourse anymore, but that's exactly where I was going to go with that. The, the third thing that I believe we're going to, you know, we're facing, we're, we're not going to see the abortion issue settle in any way. This is going to continue to be a, a hot button, a hot point, and those three things we're going to continue to deal with. And as we continue to watch our free speech erode, all three of those issues, be it LGBT, be it religious uh, speech as far as speaking about cultic or occultic or world religions and so on, you know, all religions can be wrong, but they can't all be right. Jesus is the only way. The minute you say that, you're, uh, you're speaking hate speech, oh, yeah. according to these folks. And of course, the third thing is abortion. So that's what we're facing. But this tells me Jesus is coming soon. This, this <laughs> shows me the bright mm -hmm. hour that we're in and the great opportunity we have as Christians to stand up and see, uh, see a harvest of those who will listen to the truth. Uh, that, that reminds me of that great statement uh, by the pastor who said that uh, the world is growing glor gloriously dark. Adrian Rogers. But, you have, to, but yeah. you have to understand Bible prophecy and understand what he means by that. That's right. Because exactly. Jesus said, I'm going to come back at a time when it's as bad as it was in the days of Noah. Yeah. 
So yes. that's the good side of this. That is a good side it's of it. It's a fulfillment of Bible prophecy. It is a fulfillment of Bible prophecy. <laughs> and, and that tells me, I mean, you look around us today, all the events, we just uh, passed Israel's 70th anniversary. I mean, all these events um, taking place today tell me where we are. And the technology we have that will be available to Antichrist to track the people of the world, mm -hmm. that was never available till this day we're in. Right. We're seeing all these things come into line. It's going to mean perilous times for us now, but uh, it, that doesn't mean we should be fearful. God hasn't given us a spirit of fear. Mm -hmm. We're to go forward understanding we're here on a mission. Most of the church, however, is just happy to say, I've got a nice place I can go every Sunday morning to feel that I've got friends that are a little bit nicer yeah, than the people in the world, and, and they don't understand we're here to make an impact. Yes, uh, it's, uh, it's amazing how quiet the church is concerning the issues of society. Most pastors are afraid they're going to step on some toes, they're going to make somebody mad. And so, as Donald Wyman says, we have 300,000 silent pulpits of people not speaking out. Yeah. And we've got to stand. We're called to be salt and light. That's we right. are to stand. And you know, I talked to Don Wyman one time personally about his uh, tremendous effort to bring uh, some uh, civility to television and movies. And he said, David, my worst critics are pastors. He said, I get huh. letters from them all the time condemning yeah. me, saying, hey, <clears throat> it's worse than it was 20 years ago. You're just knocking your head against the wall. You're not making any progress. Why don't you just quit? You're not winning. And you know what he always writes back? God didn't call me to win. He called me to stand. We're not going to win until Jesus Christ returns. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I like yeah. that. Oh, me too. And I've appreciated what his stands all of <laughs> all of them that he's taken through the years, and that, that's what we need to be. A lot of the, the pulpits have turned to the, the user-friendly feel-good messages because they, they're more interesting in attracting the people and putting warm bodies in the seats than they are in making a difference and seeing souls won. Yeah. Well, uh, we're going to take a break here, but when we come back, I, one thing I want in particular to, you to address is um, one of the fastest growing apostasies in the church today, and that is the teaching that there are many different roads to God. We must be tolerant because there's many different roads okay. to God. And I also want you, when we come back, to explain to our viewers, what in the world does it mean when you have an apologetics mem uh, ministry? Yeah. People always ask me, what are they apologizing <laughs> for? Uh, I know. <laughs> and, and, and a discernment okay. ministry. What does that mean? Because you are basically have an apologetics discernment right. ministry. So I want you to, to define that for our viewers so that they'll understand that you're not going around apologizing to anybody <laughs> no. about anything. Okay. <laughs> okay. That's okay. True. We'll come back in just a moment. Right. I want to personally urge you to get a copy of my newest book titled, God's Prophetic Voices to America. This is my 16th book and I consider it to be the most important one I have ever written. It presents summaries of the prophetic messages of 13 people whom God has anointed to point out the sins of our nation and call us to repentance. Those people include four from the past and nine who are currently speaking out, warning our nation that we are headed for destruction if we do not repent. The voices of the past include Peter Marshall, David Wilkerson, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, and Francis Schaeffer. And the current voices include Don Wildman, Jan Markell, Albert Moeller, and Jonathan Kahn, among five others. This is a book with a very urgent and vital message that both you and your pastor need to read. We can provide it to you for a gift of $20 or more, including the cost of shipping. And since we are very anxious to get the book into the hands of pastors, we will ship you two copies of it for a gift of $30 or more, including shipping. If you desire the special offer of two copies, ask for offer number 780. You can place your order by calling the number on the screen Monday through Friday between 8 a.m. and 5 p.m. Central Time, or you can place your order through our website at lambline.com. Welcome back to Christ in Prophecy and our discussion with Eric Barger about the perilous times in which we live. Now, Eric, I hear that you go around apologizing for us all the time, saying, I'm sorry. Why are you so apologetic? I got a letter from a pastor friend of mine, and it was a, 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 a recommendation letter. Okay. The next day, I got another letter from him. Uh -huh. And that one began, Eric Barger is the greatest apologizer I know. If you need something to <laughs> apologize for, just bring him to your church and take him around town, you know. <laughs> 
And I called him. His name's Bob. I called him, okay. Bob, which letter should I use? You know, anyway. <laughs> but uh, apologetics is really the Bible term, biblical term for the defense of the faith, used eight times in the New Testament. So okay. uh, we're always ready to be able to give every man an answer for the hope that lies within us. That word answer in 1 Peter 3.15 is apologetics in the Greek. So, apologetics is a defense of the faith, showing the defense of the faith. So, you're, that's you're, the you're wearing the armor, you're defending that's right. the gospel. And hopefully yeah. doing so in such a way that we're not cutting people up and yes, beating them up. Definitely. And that's not the issue and that's not what we should be doing in it. But we share the truth. Oftentimes the truth hurts. Mm -hmm. And people don't want to hear some of these things, but it's our job to tell them. What I hear over and over these days from many sources, including people who claim to be evangelicals, is that doctrine simply is not important. What is your response to that? Well, that's what the emergent church was built oh, on. I know. <laughs> and of course, emergent isn't a word they use anymore, but the whole philosophy is still there. And it's really permeated more of our once solid denominations than you would imagine. But that's the thing. People decide that they don't want to hear about doctrine. Uh, people have heard it and they don't need to hear it anymore. We want to hear about life application. What, you know, how to live a successful life, how to balance your checkbook, how to, have, how to raise a good family. And all that's fine. But if we don't attach the gospel to whatever we do, have we really given them anything that's of any eternal significance? Well, you yeah, know, one point. of the leading candidates for President of the Southern Baptist uh, Convention wrote an article uh, last year in which he said that Muslims and Christians worship the same God. And I heard some people in the Southern Baptist Convention say, well, you know, he's a young guy and he doesn't really know theology very well. They, they were excusing this. Wow. Wow. Well, Allah is not Jehovah. And, and the <laughs> Jesus of the Bible is not the Jesus that's spoken about well, 97 let's get into times. That for a in the Are there many different roads to God and, and, uh, and what about the gods of... Well, of just, just take Islam. I mean, they may talk about a God and Islam in the, in the Quran. Uh, Jesus is spoken of 97 times. But the Jesus of the Quran is never deified, mm -hmm. did not die on a cross, did not pay for our sins. He's going to be the enforcer for Allah. That's basically a way to look He's at it. He's going to knock all the crosses down and kill all the pigs. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Anybody yeah. who didn't uh, surrender to Muhammad's teaching, he's going to take care of him in the end. That, that's not the Jesus of the Bible. And so we have these misconceptions all around us. How many of the cults use the word Jesus? Or claim the scriptures, or, or if they or do quote use the Jesus, it's a fake Jesus. It's the Jesus who is Michael the Archangel, or something exactly. like that. Exactly. I spoke at that at uh, <laughs> the Lamb and Lion Conference a few years <laughs> yeah, ago about right. that. So, um, you know, that's the thing. That there may be people claiming all these different paths to God, or that all paths lead to the same place. Yeah. That's not at all what the Scripture you know teaches. What? All paths do lead to the same place. They lead to a God who's going to judge. Well, <laughs> when you around, look huh? at it like yeah. that, but the ending result the is ending one result of two places. No, so that's the thing. Do you see that move towards universalism in our perilous times as moving towards, say, the harlot religion that will start the, the tribulation? Uh, yeah, because man becomes, I think, deified in the end, or at least in his own mind. Okay, and so universalism so, really is humanism. Well, I, I've said for a long time that the New Age is moving closer to humanism yes. and humanism moving closer to the New Age. And sometimes you really can't tell one from the other until you can dig into the person who's teaching it. Interesting. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, uh, Pastor Robert Jeffress uh, of First Baptist Church right. often points out that every religion in the world except Christianity can be summed up in one word, and that word is do. You've got to work your way to heaven. Christianity is the only one that can be summed up with the word done. Right. Over and done with on the cross by Jesus Christ. There's nothing that we can do except accept Him. You, you, exactly, that's exactly right. I, I think we honestly, it, it's part of our fallen Adamic nature to believe that we can do anything to save ourselves. Um, that any of our works can do anything. People get the cart before the horse and don't realize that we we don't work to get saved. We work because <laughs> we are saved. saved. Yes. And when we get that right, the pressure goes away. You know, that all that idea of that we have to be perfect somehow. And I know yeah. in Him I'm perfect. In me I'm not. And, yeah. and I can do nothing to save myself. Right, right. Well, it's uh, uh, very disturbing to see how many people are... In fact, uh, today if you, if you say something to the effect that uh, Jesus is the only way, you are declared to be a bigot, intolerant, whatever. Even among Christians you find this, and I always say to them, 
I'm not saying that. Jesus said that. That's Do you right. believe Jesus was really God in the flesh? Do you believe He was the Son of God? He said it. Yeah. Now, are you going to accept it or not? Well, it's just not tolerant. Not there, Jesus. Yeah. yeah. Well, we're, we're not called to, to worry about how it lands with somebody. We're <laughs> called true. to put it out there, put the truth out. That way, whoever God is trying to deal with, well, I think everybody has a, should have an opportunity to hear the gospel. And if they don't accept it, that's a different story. But we've got to put it out there and be faithful with the gospel and not try to figure out how we can somehow make it palatable to somebody. The minute we do that, we start watering down the truth of the gospel. You know, there was a time when uh, you could say you were an evangelical and that meant something. It meant that you relied on the Bible for everything that you mm -hmm. believed in your life practices and everything. But today, that term is used by people who don't even believe the Bible is inerrant. Oh, they believe it's sad. full of all kinds of myth and legends and superstitions. It, it has ceased to have any meaning. And mainly this is among people who are in what came to be known as the emergent church uh, movement. You said it's not called that anymore, but you know a lot about it. Tell us some of the characteristics of that movement. Well, you're right about the whole de the definition of the word evangelical because it used to be I could say I'm evangelical yeah. and people would understand what I meant. Yeah. Now I have to give them at least a paragraph <laughs> so they understand that I'm not what maybe some other people think is evangelical. I believe that I'm a Bible believer first and foremost. You know, that's interesting that's the best you should way. say that because somebody asked me, or wrote me recently and said, you need to to phrase things differently or people are going to think you're a fundamentalist. And I wrote back and I said, you know, really I am a fundamentalist. Yeah. I don't use that term because it has so much baggage yeah. in Islamic. terms of being super legalistic yeah. and all that. Yeah. So I just tell people I'm a Bible believing Christian. That's the best way. I mean, I've, I've, I've gone from saying I'm evangelical to that. <laughs> that that's, that's what exactly. I've been to. Well, wasn't exactly. there a Barna poll that came out that showed that only 9% uh, of, of, of people say that, yeah. Have a biblical worldview. Biblical worldview. In other words, Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Christians. And, wow. Wow. Have a biblical worldview. Wow, that that makes us all begin to check ourselves. That's oh, yeah. parallel. It should. Yeah. That's parallel. Yeah. Yeah. That is well, parallel times. The, uh, what are the characteristics well, of this movement? Well, the, the emergent church really believed that a new church must emerge to meet the needs of the the millennial crowd mm -hmm. of the postmodern group. That they wouldn't accept Christianity the way it's always been, and so we needed a new church. And in the process of that, uh, listening to some of their leaders, and I've been in a couple of the conferences well, and you. heard them heard their, what I call the godfather of the, of the emergent movement, redefine Christianity to say that we're here to save planet Earth. That John 3.16 isn't about saving the lost in the world. Not the world. It's about the, the Earth, the world. And he wow. makes that point in one of his books. In so, fact, you went to one of his rallies up in Washington State, and what did he ask it, people to do at the end of the It come was forward? in Idaho, but yes, sure. you, you, you remember. We, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he said to come up and take water from a vat and rebaptize yourself into the new Christianity. Yeah. And then he said, and there was a vat on the table, and there was a tub that a farmer might feed livestock from. And that tub was full of dirt. And he said, while you're here, put your hands in the dirt, his exact words, to see what needs to be saved. The dirt? The dirt. Yes. The earth. Yes. He, yeah. you know, and he makes that point very clearly in and his book. And this is a very influential person. Very. Him, very. One of the most what, sought uh, after you know, speakers. One of the characteristics of that movement is that uh, instead of getting up and, and let's say teaching a sermon about homosexuality and what the Bible has to say about it, instead the approach is, well, how do you feel about it? Let's all talk about it. Now, how do you feel? It's a about conversation it? with it never has a period at the end. Yeah, no, yeah. no. You feelings know, over facts. It just keeps going, and it's all about feelings. As if and how it's one I the, feel about something is as important as what God has said about it. Th that's it. Wow. One of the six characteristics of, of emergent ideas is feelings are more important than truth. Absolutely. Huh. Absolutely. So and that boy, would put that us gets God's you in God. trouble fast. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we become right. gods. Yep. We are the well, God of the religion. In the end, right? it's, a, it's us. Okay. It's all about us. And if you tell a narcissistic group of people who have been raised to believe that they should be served in every way, that church is about them, you can get them to come to church, but not if you begin to tell them the truth that it's not about them, it's about God. I had so much trouble when we first moved to Dallas looking, finding a church because so many of the churches, the service was all about us. The worship was what God's doing for you. The sermon was how to help yourself. It took a few churches before we found one that put God at the center of the worship service. How do you think I felt when I moved back to the Seattle area? The <laughs> oh, yeah. least church oh, county in the United States You're is where the I live. Of paganism. Yeah. It took yeah, us one exactly. church to choose from, It right? took us eight months, and of course I was traveling some, but Melanie and wow. my daughter, my wife Melanie and my daughter, both they looked and I looked. Finally we said, well, I guess this is it. Well, you just and don't understand. In Washington State the essence of religion is tree hugging. Well, that's really true. There's an <laughs> awful lot of very New Agey, ethereal, kind of self-styled self New Age stuff. 
but we finally found a decent church, a good yeah, church, and gospels being preached, but they're few and far between. Praise well, you know, God. people are so concerned these days about uh, hurting people's feelings, and certainly we shouldn't desire to hurt people's feelings, but on the other hand, we need to confront them as sinners. And, and the gospel has never changed. You confront people with the fact that they are sinners, and you tell them what they must do about that. And that is going to offend people. Yeah, it, it is. And, and as I've said now, we, we don't need to beat people up in the process. Yeah. No. But um, it is a loving act to tell people the truth, especially if their eternity is at stake. And that's up to us to do. Yeah. It's just not to, for you, you. It's not for us here. Yeah. It's not for people uh, that uh, are in so-called full-time ministry. It's for the entire church who really believes the Bible to share this with a lost world. So what is your message to the viewer about uh, standing? Uh, we're supposed to be salt and light. What does that mean? Oh, I, I think that's one of the most important things, that in every way, the way we conduct ourselves in our lives, in our businesses, in our marriages, of course, in our interactions with others, uh, to let that light shine. Yeah. And it doesn't mean we're holier than thou. It doesn't mean that we walk around looking uh, whatever spiritual looks like, I'm not sure. But we, we've got to present truth in such a way that people understand that there is only one way, that time is short, that if we are in perilous times, that trumpet call could happen any time. And that's the, that's the thing, is sharing people with an urgency. If the church just had the urgency, Dr. Reagan, that would be the key right there. Yeah. Well, and it also means standing for, uh, if we don't stand for righteousness, nobody's going to stand for righteousness. That's right. It's going to become increasingly difficult to do so. Already it's difficult right. for people to stand because when they take a stand, it may mean their job promotion. It may mean their job itself. That's right. That's right. We've seen people fired over saying, bless you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, somebody did that recently on this trip, actually. Someone somewhere um, that was serving me in a restaurant or whatever, a gas station. She said, have a blessed day. I said, I love that answer, that response, you know. <laughs> so, I've commented back to her, you know, but some places that might cost you your job. Oh, right. So, we urge you to stand for righteousness. That's what we need to do in these end times. Yeah. Speak out, and you can do it in many different ways. You know, uh, people always ask me, well, what should I do? I say, pray, the Lord will show you. He'll show you. That's right. Well, folks, that's our program for today. And as we bring it to a close, I want to thank Eric for being our special guest. Eric, thank you, and God bless you. Thank you, David. My pleasure to be here. Okay. Eric, can you look at that camera and tell folks how they can get in touch with your ministry? Sure. It's just ericbarger.com is the best way. My name all run together, ericbarger.com. Well, that's pretty simple. Folks, Eric's prepared a 100-minute video album titled Preparing for Perilous Times. You can order a copy of it through his website. Well, folks, I want to thank you for watching our program today. I hope the Lord willing that you'll be back with us again next week. Until then, this is Dave Reagan speaking for Lamb and Lion Ministries saying, Look up, be watchful, for our redemption is drawing near. I want to personally urge you to get a copy of my newest book titled, God's Prophetic Voices to America. This is my 16th book and I consider it to be the most important one I have ever written. We can provide it to you for a gift of $20 or more, including the cost of shipping. And since we are very anxious to get the book into the hands of pastors, we will ship you two copies of it for a gift of $30 or more, including shipping. If you desire the special offer of two copies, ask for offer number 780. Thank you for joining us on today's Christ in Prophecy, a presentation of Lamb and Lion Ministries, a non-denominational ministry dedicated to teaching the fundamentals of biblical prophecy and proclaiming the soon return of Jesus. 